interesting. Uh, we've talked a lot about measuring um, in terms of the the biomarker data. So you said like a standard blood panel, but do you get anything else? And uh, so you do the standard blood panel like every two months or yep. so on. Uh, but do you do like a bigger one every year or is there anything you measure every day? So every day it's uh, diet. Um, again, so, you know, macro micronutrients and the individual food amounts, and then the fitness tracker gives me resting heart rate, heart rate variability, um, uh, average daily heart rate, sleep stages, total sleep length. And eventually this fitness tracker, I guess, is going to be upgraded sometime in the next few months where I, I just won't have, um, heart rate variability one time point. It'll give me average heart rate variability for the whole day. So I'm looking forward to that. Um, but yeah, it's, uh, I blood test every two months. Actually, um, I'm, as I mentioned, I'm a blood test. I'm in a blood test on Monday. That's about six weeks. So I'm thinking about bouncing this up to eight times a year next year. Um, and for me, that's really pushing the upper limit of how often I want to be blood tested. I do have a couple of clients that blood test every month. So they're, they've done it 12 times in the past year. Uh, so, you know, more data is better, uh, for people who want to go more often. I, I encourage it for people who aren't comfortable to go more often. That's okay too. As long as we have all of the track variables, you know, we can look at a three month period of dietary data against the blood test. It doesn't have to be a two month or a one month uh, period, but yeah, I, I, uh, I, it's the, it's the CBC test from again, life extension foundation. That's other places you can get your blood test. That's what I use. Um, so I get the CBC test from them and, uh, I add on, uh, C reactive proteins not included. So I add that on, uh, add in homocysteine because if I don't track that regularly, it's easy for me to be, uh, at about 15, which is probably about two times higher than it should be. So I keep a, a pretty close uh, eye on that. And then lipoprotein A, which is a lipoprotein, um, similar to H, uh, LDL. Um, I tend to be at the high end of the range or higher. Um, and what's interesting there is that there's very little, um, published data in terms of what reduces it, but I find that actually eating a higher fat diet reduces it. Uh, and there've been some recent publications along those lines, actually case studies. So, uh, it is a malleable factor. Um, so homocysteine, C-reactive protein, uh, lipoprotein A, and then, you know, other things occasionally like uh, vitamin D for my November test, um, PSA once or twice a year, just to stay on top of that and, um, you know, avoid any potential, uh, prostate cancer things just creeping up out of nowhere. Um, but that's a pretty, I've done other things too, you know, like uh, TNF alpha and IL six, but that's a more complicated test. You've got to send it back on dry ice and it's uh, a couple hundred dollars more in cost that I'm not looking to spend. So I'm, I'm spending about a hundred dollars a month in blood testing, uh, every month uh, on average. Do you, have you ever done like one of these more detailed, um, lipid panels? So looking at like the levels of LDL particles and stuff like that. I haven't, but I haven't, but, um, that doesn't, you know, it, it, that test may be better than, um, you know, the standard LDL, HDL, uh, VLDL, uh, lipoprotein A, but I have all of the major lipoprotein classes there. Um, is that going to explain more of my cardiovascular risk by getting the, you know, uh, the more detailed analysis? I'm not sure that that's the case. Um, there's even recent data on the APOB, APOA1 ratio, which, I haven't made a video about that yet, but it plays into that story. So APO, APO B is found only in the non HDL lipoproteins. So VLDL, LDL, lipoprotein A and APOA1 is only found in HDL. So I guess that's in a recent paper that was shown to be better than, um, other measures of cardiovascular risk, you know, than the standards. I don't remember exactly, but that was a take home message from that paper. But, you know, even without that data, I mean, you, you can basically come to a root, uh, you know, a crude estimate of your own APOB to APOA1 ratio by looking at your non-HDL cholesterol divided by HDL. Um, but even there, even there, that also goes to this idea of, of biomarkers versus biomarkers. Um, and especially because uh, the LDL story isn't necessarily linear in terms of its association with all-cause mortality risk. So there are studies in very old, you know, above 80 years old, people who are above 80, that people who have higher total cholesterol and higher LDL have better survival than people who have lower. So, you know, if you only, if I only followed the published studies, then I think, well, my LDL is somewhere in the 80 to 110 range. That's too low. Maybe it should be 140. Um, but I've compared my own LDL against these, you know, the, the big picture, these big picture biomarkers. And within my LDL range, for me, 
that's correlated, uh, lower LDL in my range is correlated with more biomarkers going in the right direction than wrong. So even though at advanced age, having higher LDL may be protective, at least for me at my age, having LDL towards the lower end of my range, somewhere in the eighties is correlated with more biomarkers going in the wrong direction than not. So, um, now the, the best part would be to actually get your coronary uh, artery calcium score to see if there's calcification in the arteries rather than the, you know, the, the particle testing or, you know, the individual lipoproteins, LDL, HDL, VLDL, lipoprotein A is to actually see how much calcification you have, because there are, there are, you know, published studies of people who have very high levels of uh, circulating cholesterol, but their arteries are free and clear. And conversely, you can have people who have very low levels of cholesterol and have calcification in their arteries. So yeah, I keep saying that's on my list. I really need to get that done at some point. Heart disease runs in my family. Um, and if you, that's probably one of the biggest factors that I bet would affect, uh, health disease and aging, because if your arteries are narrowed by some amount, it's, you're making it harder for blood and oxygen and nutrition to get to the brain. And then, you know, potentially you've got some suboptimal, you know, uh, uh, um, you know, feeding of your brain, whether it's oxygen nutrients or whatever. So basically atherosclerosis, even subclinical would be driving some measure of aging. So, um, just only relying on the blood data is may not be the best strategy there. Do you track your, your fat percentage? I mean, do you have like a, a scale or do you get that done when you get your blood markers done? Fat, when you say fat percent, oh, percent? Body, body fat percent. Oh. Sorry. I, mean. I, I have done that. I've done that. I think three times over the past 10 years, but I tend not to focus on, on, uh, you know, so there, there's another variable here too. And imagine if I, I, this coming from me, someone who's, uh, you know, dedicating so much time every day. It's not ours, but still it's dedicating time every day where when I start talking about things like the coronary artery, ca artery calcium score, that means I've, now I've got to go into the hospital and, uh, and actually do an extra test and take time out of my day or go to the DEXA machine, right. To measure my body composition. Like now this is an extra layer of, of, uh, data and time and effort. So at least for DEXA, I've done it, you know, um, it, for me, I know where I am in terms of body composition. I can see it in the mirror, right? So I know how lean I am and I know how that correlates with the DEXA data. And actually my workouts too, I track my strength. I, I do a pretty standard workout. So I know, I know, you know, uh, how strong, I, how strong I am in each movement. So I know if my strength is getting better, worse, or staying the same. And it's in most areas, it's staying the same. In some areas it's staying better. None of it is definitely getting is none of it is getting worse. But in terms of body composition, yeah, I keep a close eye on it just by mirror, while also knowing that I've done, you know, the body composition testing three times in 10 years to know what the mirror looks like in terms of a number, right? So, um, but I, it, more important there would probably be bone density, right? So how do you gauge bone density other than you can't do that by mirror, right? Muscle and fat, you can do by mirror, but the bone density is the big one for, for uh, Dex. I haven't. Yeah, I haven't paid attention to that, but uh, I'm doing, I'm doing, ba I'm at basically the upper limit. You know, I walk, so I'm getting weight bearing exercise on my legs. I'm doing uh, weight bearing exercise, deadlifts, you know, which I'm pulling heavy weights. So I'm getting, you know, weight bearing exercise there and it's not insignificant amounts. So I don't know what else I could do extra in terms of potentially slowing age related losses for bone density or increasing it other than what I'm doing now. So if that's the case, going for the DEXA and body composition wouldn't add much value for me at this point. 